MDMA could be a useful tool in psychotherapy for a range of conditions, including PTSD, depression, and anxiety. Its efficacy in PTSD has received a lot of attention, primarily thanks to the work of MAPS. Because of MAPS' dedication to the subject since the 1980s, we have a growing body of research that supports the use of MDMA-assisted psychotherapy. Other drugs, especially psychedelics, could also be useful in therapy, though MDMA does have some unique qualities. As Rick Doblin, the founder of MAPS, has explained, in terms of therapeutic potential, MDMA is remarkably effective, gentle yet profound, because it operates on emotions more so than cognitive processing. The MDMA state is only subtly different than normal. As a result, the thoughts and emotions of the MDMA state can be easily remembered after the effects of the drug have worn off, facilitating integration and long-term growth. He also noted that while it doesn't have the same physical safety as a drug like LSD, it has a psychological safety profile that's superior to that of all other psychedelics. Therapists have noticed since the 1970s that MDMA might be useful in psychiatry. Many thousands of people have experienced psychological benefits from the substance, though just a tiny portion of those experiences have occurred in the context of research. Compared to regular psychedelics, MDMA was found to have some useful qualities. It has a relatively short duration, a comparatively mild activity, and it doesn't distract the user with perceptual effects or thought distortions. That's not to say drugs like LSD and and psilocybin aren't useful. In fact, research is also starting to support their use, but MDMA definitely seems well-suited for therapy. Early reports from the 1970s and 1980s suggested it could help with depression, anxiety, PTSD, and other conditions. One of the only formal examinations of the drug's effects occurred from 1980 to 1983. 29 people were given the drug, typically 75 to 150 milligrams. Most found it offered psychological benefits during and after the effects wore off. However, this research didn't exclusively involve people with the diagnosed conditions, nor was it placebo-controlled. But that paper did support what many people had reported, namely that MDMA, like the traditional psychedelics, could facilitate useful experiences and offer positive psychological changes. Despite its apparent utility, MDMA was banned in 1985. In 1986, MAPS was founded, and it's been working to make psychedelics available in controlled settings ever since. After overcoming some opposition to the research, the first phase one dose response study of MDMA in the US was published in 1996. In healthy volunteers, MDMA caused an increase in temperature, heart rate, and blood pressure, but those increases were tolerable. MAPS was then able to pursue phase two treatment studies for PTSD in the 2000s. Because that research has been encouraging, MAPS is moving into phase three studies studies and MDMA-assisted psychotherapy could be legalized by the early 2020s. PTSD is a stress-related psychiatric condition that stems from events like war, sexual abuse, violence, and accidents. Although SSRIs and non-drug psychotherapy can be helpful, not everyone responds to them. Two primary studies have been published on MDMA-assisted psychotherapy, and the results from a third should be available soon. Between those results and anecdotal reports, the drug seems to be very useful even in cases where people have had PTSD for many years and haven't responded to other treatments. The basic setup for a MAP study involves two to three drug sessions. They're spaced out around a month from each other. Participants will typically be lying on a futon. Sometimes they'll be wearing eye shades and sometimes they'll be listening to music. During each session, two therapists are present with one on each side. Throughout the session, the participant engages in talk therapy and introspection. The first clinical trial sponsored by MAPS began in Spain in the early 2000s. Although the research was never completed due to political pressure, six women with PTSD from sexual assault were studied. Those results suggested MDMA-assisted therapy was superior to non-drug therapy. Our first good look at the drug's efficacy came from a phase two study published in 2011. 20 participants entered the trial, with 12 initially getting MDMA and eight receiving placebo. They had an estimated duration of PTSD symptoms of 19 years. Their PTSD typically came from sexual assault, childhood abuse, or violence. MDMA was given at 125 milligrams and, when 
appropriate, a 62.5 milligram supplement was available two to 2.5 hours later. With two drug-assisted sessions, there was a significantly greater improvement on the clinician-administered PTSD scale compared to non-drug therapy. The benefits lasted at least two months after the last MDMA session. 83% no longer met criteria for PTSD versus 25% with placebo. Three of the patients who were unable to work because of their PTSD were able to return to work. After the two-month follow-up, placebo participants were given the opportunity to receive MDMA. In this group, known as the crossover group, there was a 100% clinical response rate and the magnitude of the improvement was similar to those who first received MDMA. No one had any severe adverse effects from MDMA during the study. Some of the negatives were jaw tightness, nausea, dizziness, loss of appetite, and impaired balance. At the two-month follow-up, there was zero evidence of a negative negative impact on cognition. Those results were encouraging on their own, but even more data supporting MDMA's efficacy appeared in 2013. Another paper was published showing the long-term effects of MDMA-assisted therapy in the same group of people. 16 of the 19 who received MDMA completed the full examination. At this point, they had gone more than three years without receiving the drug. On average, improvement and remission continued to exist. Only two people experienced a relapse. The mean CAP score didn't change between two months and 3.5 years after the study ended. Even with the most conservative estimate of long-term efficacy, MDMA-assisted psychotherapy seemed to offer a significant and sustained improvement in 74% of patients. Another double-blind study was published in 2013. Only 12 people were involved in this one, and it compared a full MDMA dose, 125 milligrams, to an active placebo of 25 milligrams. Eight people initially received the full dose and four received placebo. Between baseline and three weeks after the last session, there was a greater decline in CAP scores in the MDMA group versus placebo. However, the decline wasn't statistically significant, possibly due to the small sample size. Yet there was a large effect size and a significant improvement on another PTSD scale. In the second stage of the study, the placebo participants were able to get MDMA. All four responded to the treatment, with two no longer having PTSD and two reporting a decline in symptoms. There was a further improvement in CAP scores during that one-year period. Based on this placebo-controlled research, people with PTSD who've been resistant to other treatments can receive lasting benefit from MDMA-assisted psychotherapy, and they're able to receive that benefit with relatively minimal and short-lived side effects. To add some perspective to the research, here are some quotes from investigators and participants. Michael Mithofer, one of the main investigators, said, The effects of MDMA appear to increase the likelihood that participants will be able to maintain enough trust in the therapists and a broad enough perspective about their own inner experience to process their fears without emotionally or physically withdrawing from the therapeutic alliance. And here are some quotes from participants. Without the study, I don't think I could have ever dug down deep. I was so afraid of the fear. Maybe one of the things the drug does is let your mind relax and get out of the way because the mind is so protective about the injury. It feels almost like the inner healer or the MDMA is like a maid doing spring cleaning. It's as if you thought you were cleaning before, but when you got to things you didn't really want to deal with, you just stick them in the attic. If you're going to clean the house, you can't skip the stuff in the attic. The running hypothesis for how MDMA improves therapy revolves around a couple points. First, it strengthens the therapeutic alliance between the patient and the therapist. Second, it makes it easier for people to explore their trauma by spending more time in the optimal arousal zone. This is a state at which both hyperarousal and hypoarousal are avoided. Some of the typical barriers to treatment include a particularly strong emotional response to trauma that makes therapy difficult, or or emotional under-engagement, which also isn't useful. MDMA seems to help people overcome both of those barriers, which makes a therapy session more productive. During a session, it may facilitate memory retrieval and reconsolidation. When people are in the reconsolidation process, new associations of safety can be attached to stressful life experiences. This kind of altered perspective is possible due to MDMA offering a less rigid form of thinking, somewhat 
somewhat similar to psychedelics. Remember the patient who likened the effects to a maid doing spring cleaning, who's exposing you to everything you need to deal with? Well, that seems to hold true when looking at the data. Although the MAPS protocol allows a therapist to bring up the source of a patient's PTSD, this is rarely necessary. Instead, participants naturally navigate to the trauma in nearly every case. This suggests that when defensive mechanisms are dampened, processing can naturally begin to occur. MDMA doesn't make the PTSD-related processing enjoyable, but it makes it possible, which is the key factor. On the pharmacological level, there are a few things contributing to MDMA's efficacy. It has effects on the monoamines, particularly serotonin, but also norepinephrine and dopamine. Through those effects, it could lower fear recognition, aggression, defensiveness, and anxiety. At the same time, it may offer increased self-confidence and improved mood. 5-HT2A activity could alter perception of meaning, which can help people engage in new ways of thinking about old memories. Norepinephrine Nephrine and dopamine activity may lead to higher arousal and alertness, contributing to the optimal arousal zone. On the endocrine level, higher oxytocin, prolactin, and vasopressin may facilitate trust between the patient and therapist, while also making it easier to deal with traumatic memories. A study in rats found MDMA leads to pro-social activity, seemingly via 5-HT1A agonism and an increase in oxytocin. We also know MDMA increases plasma oxytocin in humans and leads to pro-social activity. Two brain areas that may play a role in emotional regulation in PTSD are the amygdala and ventromedial prefrontal cortex. In humans, MDMA has been shown to increase activity in the VMPFC while decreasing it in the amygdala. This this might reduce emotional avoidance and help people revisit and process traumatic memories. The extinction of a conditioned fear response is something that involves the VMPFC, so MDMA's impact on that brain region could be important during therapy. Norepinephrine and cortisol, both of which increase from MDMA, may also help with fear extinction during therapy sessions. Another potential factor is MDMA increasing BDNF expression, which could assist the recoding of traumatic memories. In mice, MDMA facilitates fear extinction in a BDNF-dependent manner, something that may also apply to humans. To recap, MDMA has various effects on serotonin, norepinephrine, dopamine, oxytocin, cortisol, and BDNF that may contribute to more productive therapy sessions. Late in 2016, the FDA indicated it was ready for MAPS to move forward with the final stages of research needed to potentially legalize MDMA-assisted psychotherapy. Those final stages involved testing MDMA in Phase 3 trials. Compared to Phase 2, the Phase 3 studies involve significantly more people and they'll give us much more data about its efficacy and potential side effects. As of right now, planning is underway for the research. The first double-blind Phase 3 study Study should begin around April 2018 and another should take place in 2019. MAPS's new drug application for MDMA-assisted psychotherapy could be processed by the FDA in 2021. Every indication so far suggests the FDA and authorities in Europe will end up approving MDMA for use in psychotherapy. Once it's approved, the range of conditions MDMA is being used for could increase. Among the applications that have been discussed for it are in social anxiety, depression, and addiction. If you want to learn more, I recommend visiting the Drug Classroom website using the link in the description. And if you have any questions, feel free to ask them in the comments. The Drug Classroom is exclusively funded by donations. If you'd like to support, please do so on patreon.com slash the drug classroom.